All right, it popped up again. This is me pitching a ball that's impossible to hit. And I engineered it out of necessity because I'm facing off against the world's greatest wiffle ball players. Now, wiffle ball is the popular backyard version of baseball here in America. What makes it really interesting is the balls have these holes on one side, which means they can curve like crazy. Oh my God, the new version of wiffle ball. So wiffle ball is to baseball. What base or water, water bottle cap ball is to wiffle ball. I kind of fucked up the words there. But basically wiffle ball is like a, like a like a kid version where the ball spins a lot more. Then there's this thing that I've seen people play online where they use a bottle cap, you know like the top of a bottle cap if you ever put it between your fingers and you flick it. Fing. People do that and they flick that and they swing at it like it's baseball. And that shit moves like like crazy. Bottle cap uh baseball. It is it is literally a bottle cap. Isn't that crazy? Real thing. Real thing. It pops on my TikTok sometimes. Just like fucking cool bottle cap pitches that they're just doing with with the same way that you would do it if you were just a kid. You go like that, but like they're really good at it. And what's surprising to me is they hit it. What a small target. They hit it with like a wiffle ball bat because wiffle ball bats are, are pretty thin. But how does that work? And how do baseballs or really balls from any sport actually curve through the air? It's called for a that Magnus matter. effect. So today we're gonna test our way to find an answer to that question. And since I grew up playing countless hours of wiffle ball myself, I'm gonna revive a lifelong dream of going head to head against the pros. And I don't wanna give too much away, but I might have had to rely on my engineering skills to level the playing field. Now the whole idea for this journey of discovery started with an impromptu visit to my childhood home in Brea, California. This is the most American home I've ever seen in my life. The last time I lived here was over two decades ago, so I'm just gonna go ambush him. I want a tour. Hey, what's up? I'm Mark. <laughs> how are you? Good, how are you? Good, I used to live here. I know. Oh, we're Fucking docs to losers. Check it out. You are on camera. You're on camera. You're on camera. <laughs> Got out. So after meeting the whole family, they were kind enough to let me take a walk down memory lane. Oh my gosh. If these walls could talk. <laughs> he is a father. He talks like a father. You know, I used to keep my micro machines right in this little cabinet here. Up there. Yep. Yep. That's the room where I first jerked it. <laughs> That'd be me. I don't know what the fuck else happened to my childhood home. Yep, right there. Right there. The These walls could talk. Woo! You would not want to hear what they said. 18 times, one day. This is where me and Scott Glacier used to throw water balloons on my sister and her friend sunbathing down here. That's an option for you kids. I also took the chance to confess that all the holes in their metal shed were Aaron shots from a homemade crossbow I fashioned in eighth grade. There was a target. I wasn't very good at it, apparently. But what made me most happy to hear is how all the neighborhood kids still played out front all the time. Because while that may look like just a street to some, for us, it was a soccer, hockey, basketball, and baseball stadium where long forgotten neighborhood legends were born. That is the one of the true joys of childhood is playing any game on the street. And then when a car comes going, car! Where each game always felt so big and the only thing that could stop us was when the street lights came on, signaling it was time to go home for dinner. And to my absolute delight, they let me hop in the game. I'm gonna go ahead and call it right out of the gate. And look, I'm not gonna say it myself. Oh! But were there some murmurs that Mark the long ball legend Rober had returned? Are you just dunking on this fucking kid? <laughs> Like this 10 year old kid throwing up lobs and Mark's just repositioning, swinging on every pitch because they're freebies. I'm not gonna deny it. It's just like old times. This is great. Even at the mound, I was still slinging lasers. Still got it. And as invigorating as this was, it did make me question if I missed out on my true calling 
as a professional wiffle ball player because you should know there are actually professional wiffle ball players. And while we share a very similar origin story, our history split paths when they kept the dream alive and turned those adolescent visions of grandeur into the world's first pro wiffle ball league. In fact, this is Kyle as an 11 year old and now 14 years later as the league founder and commissioner. He me every year starting in spring, eight teams compete in a four month season with players traveling from all over the country. There's a draft, playoff, a world series, and of course for 14 years they've tracked every possible stat that is possibly trackable. As you'd expect, there's heated team rivalries and league legends like Jimmy Norp, aka the Norpedo. <laughs> what the fuck? I mean, I guess this is like this is like a summoning salt video, but real life, you know, instead of finding about some guy named Tyler, who's really good at like a golf game, you find out about a guy named Jimmy Norp, who's just nasty at wiffle ball. Who's considered by many to be the best pitching. Someone tell Toast he needs a new team. Someone tell Disguise Toast he needs a new team and he's got to start entering a new sport. All right. Get a franchise team. None of that tier two bullshit. Let's get a tier one wiffle ball team. They also started a new lacrosse league. Let's get crazy. Hitting dual threat in the league. And as the reigning back-to-back -back World Series champ, it's easy to see why. None of them get paid to play, so their truest compensation is the sheer thrill of victory in this game that has united them since childhood. Yeah! He also told me they'd be playing in Oklahoma right around the time I'd be traveling through. I was finally gonna get my chance to play under the lights in front of an actual crowd. Which meant it was time for the long ball legend to refer to himself in the third person and make his professional debut. And I was playing it cool, but right out of the gate, I spotted the unmistakable flowing hair. Who's the best? Back to back champ in the house right here. Of Jimmy, Captain Clutch North. This was definitely the big leagues. <laughs> He's the Shohei of this game, huh? How many per team? We like Pitches three, and three. hits. So we divided up into teams, and it was game on. All right, here you go, Jimmy. The commissioner plays? <laughs> Kyle connected early to get one man on, so it was over to the Red Baron to make it two. Oh, yeah, Baron. Nice. Great play. And that made it my turn. But I wasn't here to waste time just getting on bases. I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Calling the shot. Over the green monster. With the street lights of my youth finally being replaced with the stadium lights I'd always dreamed of, this was my moment. Uh-oh. What? That feels impossible to hit. Now, just like in baseball, in wiffle ball, you get four balls and three strikes. And it's a strike if it hits anywhere on the rectangular pipes, or more embarrassingly, the I like having no catcher. Metal plate in the middle. I'm sorry, team. And with the crowd visibly unimpressed, I swapped with Kyle to pinch run at second base. No, 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 no! Everywhere I go, I'm getting out. So we had two outs, but now that I'd cleared the cobwebs out, I could just sense things were about to change. Ah. Well, I think we all know I was always more of a pitcher anyways. <sighs> it was time to give these boys a little taste of old school suburban California street ball because Jimmy Norp's reign on Mount Olympus had come to an end. Oh. <laughs> Whoops. Do you take a base on that? You take a base in wiffle ball? No way. He didn't exactly fucking beam him. You know, he's not going to remember that hit tomorrow. I guess. All right. All right. Balls hurt. I do not buy that that hurt. I don't buy it. And with that absolute dinger to center field, Captain Clutch had struck again. Whoa. That's witchcraft! And look, I'm not proud of my performance, but in my defense... Can I get a cool name like Norpedo, but for Mario Party? Can, do you see John Boy Blitzball Tourney? Like Blitzball, like the game from Final Fantasy X? 
Unlike the West Coast ball I grew up playing, in the pros, as you can see here, these pitches are moving 10 feet left to right. It's like the ball had propellers and it makes it nearly impossible to figure out if it's a pitch you should swing at or a pitch you should duck from, or perhaps both. <laughs> How did he do that? Take a step back. And the back. rest of the game, Take unfortunately, it was just more of the same. You got choked <laughs> up, Mark. Although I am proud to say, in the third inning, I finally got on base. <laughs> and so despite all my best efforts, they narrowly edged us out for the win. This was not how it was supposed That's to happen. Tough. That's it was tough. gonna be a long plane ride home, but truthfully, a plan was already forming in my head to science the crud out of this and use my engineering abilities to level the playing field. And step one was shot. to fly Jimmy and Kyle out to Crunch Labs to study exactly how they can curve a ball as much as they do. And after making a bunch of observations and gathering a bunch of data myself, 70? I them straight over to the home of the San Francisco Giants because they're regarded as the team with the most advanced pitcher developing program in all of Major League Baseball. <laughs> wow. This feels pretty big. Ludpedo sounds less like a really cool nickname for someone who's talented and more like you guys are calling me a pedophile. Uh... So let's just stick with Ludwig for now, you know? And right out of the gate, I was incredibly relieved to see their elite players and coaches struggling against the Norpedo just as much as I did. Oh, that's kind of cool. They had actual baseball players. But then it was into the clubhouse for the real purpose of the trip, to meet with Brian Bannister, whose deep understanding of the science behind a spinning baseball is sort of their secret sauce for developing all these great Magnus, pictures. I knew it! got the hardware to show for it. Magnus. When you use these concepts, you win World Series. <laughs> <laughs> and so after that, I was feeling pretty good about my handle on how exactly they were making the ball curve. But oh, don't the Giants, like, win every other year or some shit? Aren't the Giants, like, really good? His final confirmation on my suspicions, he also met up with the Stanford baseball team to run one last test with a normal baseball versus an identical one that was just missing the scene. And as a further point of indication, that was 10 years ago, fair. I'm happy to report their nationally ranked batters also fell victim to Kyle and the Norpedo. Oh and so after my extensive data collection, research, and interviews, here's the answer as to how any sort of ball curves through the Magnus. air. Magnus! And it starts with a riddle. Let's say you're an astronaut on the space station, and you go out for a spacewalk to fix a solar panel with your big wrench, and as you're heading out, you get distracted by the view and miss grabbing the handle, and now you're very slowly drifting away. What do you do to save yourself? And you might say, well, you just sort of swim your way back. But in zero gravity, as demonstrated here by an actual astronaut, you can flail your arms all you want, but your center of mass won't actually move. Spin all right, to win. So did you think spin, of the answer? Spin, the spin trick to win. is you throw the wrench as fast as possible oh. in the opposite direction, and that will give you just a little push to... I don't know why I thought you should spin. Fuck me. I thought you spun in circles. Slowly move you back to the space station. And this makes intuitive sense, right? Like if you're on a skateboard and you throw something heavy to the right, you're going to move back to the left. Nate! You had one job! Well, this is exactly how rockets move around in space where there's no air. They create a chemical reaction from their fuel to make a lot of tiny wrenches, and they just throw them out of the back really fast, and the rocket naturally has to go the other way, just like you as an astronaut. So that's one thing you need to know, and the other is the Kawanda effect, which states that fluids like to Magnus? curve and flow around a smooth surface. You actually already know this if you've ever noticed how water will flow around a curved spoon. Well when I was a kid, I don't know what the fuck was wrong with me, but sometimes I would just turn the water on full blast and take a spoon and flip it right up into the water until it flew everywhere. I, I remember doing this a lot, vividly, like dozens of times, dozens. Just nobody home, just got a spoon and just f let it rock. Well, air is also a fluid, and so it curves just like water, as you can see here, because the strings are following with the airflow as it turns the round corner on the frisbee. 
Okay, so now let's put those two concepts together. From the ball's perspective, air is rushing past on the top side here and curving around really nicely because the rotation of the ball matches great with the airflow. But on the bottom side, they're opposite. So there's sort of a head-on collision with the air rushing by, creating turbulence. That means more air curves around the top, which means more little air wrenches are thrown diagonally down, and as a result, the backspun ball moves diagonally up, just like the astronaut, causing it to curve up. The fancy term for this is the Magnus effect, and big light balls like beach balls are great for demonstrating this effect because they have lots of surface area so they throw off lots of wrenches, but they're also really light so the air wrenches have more of an effect. And now that you know this, you know exactly what causes the curve on tennis balls, soccer balls, ping pong balls, record breaking basketballs, golf balls, and baseballs. With yeah, it came up yesterday, or like, uh, not yesterday, like a couple weeks ago because the the uh, dude perfect broke the world record for largest basketball shot or highest up basketball shot. The baseball, the seams help grab even more air wrenches as the ball spins, but they also provide the pitchers a better grip so they can spin the ball even faster. Our normal versus smooth ball test confirmed this when the normal baseball with seams was curving so much more. By the way, this same principle is how frisbees seem to defy gravity because air curves over the smooth edge, throwing wrenches down all around, turning it into a freaking jetpack. Now having said that, you should know that the wiffle- Why is he on like the yard set? ball is very similar yet slightly different than all of those. As long as you scuff Thanks, up the Caitlin. side with the holes, which is something all serious players will do, then by comparison, this side is now much smoother. That means the air has a much easier time curving around like water on a smooth spoon, throwing down the air wrenches, causing the ball to lift towards the smooth side. And sure enough, when we check the high speed footage, we see that in every case, the ball is curving towards the smooth side and away from the holes. So now whenever you see a ball curving, just think of tiny little astronaut wrenches flying off the back of the ball as it spins through the air. And now that the I air, knew their secrets to you. ball curvature, it was time to use that knowledge to engineer some sweet revenge with an 18 second build montage. You didn't use any of the fucking technology. You just made a drone wiffle ball. That's not, <laughs> it's not exactly the same thing. He's over engineering this, which I know is his shtick is over engineering the crap out of it. This is an easy solution, all right? You get a wiffle ball. How far is the is the pitching mound from the batting the batting batter's box or whatever the fuck you call it? Thirty feet? Maybe. 20 feet, something like that, nine feet, whatever it is, you get a string that's just one inch shorter, you throw the ball, and then right before they swing, you pull the string, fuck, even if they hit the ball, you let the string fly, and then you pull the string back, and you get the ball, easy, I've fucking, I've solved wiffle ball. And so it was back to Oklahoma with a duffel bag full of surprises addressed specifically for Jimmy North. But before we get to that, you might have noticed Crunch Labs has a new addition. Speaking of, you ever try to put a quarter on a string like Mr. Krabs does when he goes to a vending machine to get the quarter to count, but then also get the quarter back? I've always wanted to do that. My backyard. That's because to fight summer brain drain and make this your least boring summer ever, we created Camp Crunch Labs. Now Camp Crunch Labs is a 12 week virtual summer camp featuring weekly videos with mega experiments that I do, and then weekly super challenges that you do. And the best weekly challenge submission of the whole summer, it's a platinum ticket to come out here with me for the biggest mega experiment of them all in the final video of the summer. On top of that, you I bet he's gonna break the world record for toothpaste again. I feel like he loves doing that shit. Usually the Crunch Labs build boxes where we build a really fun toy together, where I teach you all the juicy physics of how they work, comes every month. But to coincide with the Camp Crunch Labs weekly challenges and videos, we can ship them to you every week. Yes, look! So if you want a 12 week summer camp where you can learn to think like an engineer with 0% chance of bug bites and poison ivy, Head to campcrunchlabs.com to reserve one of the limited spots, and I'll see you at summer camp. It's a cute idea. Nerdy kids are losing their minds right now. 
Oh, look who it is. It's probably a better use of money than my old RuneScape and Dofus subscriptions, MMORPG subscriptions. Not the most value you'd get from that. Oh, Got gotcha. you a Number one. I took the opportunity of admiring my new gift to avoid making eye contact with the Norpedo and his tactics of intimidation. Got a bag of stuff here. Should be a little bit better than last time. Play ball. <laughs> The rematch was officially on. All right, I'm at the mound. Let's go. And word must have spread because an even larger crowd had gathered to watch. Playing with the pros had been my childhood dream, yet my last outing was closer to a nightmare. So I decided to give them a small taste of what they could expect for round two and wound up to deliver the hot, steamy appetizer. Dinner is served. Now all I had to do was retrieve and reload. <laughs> Just awkwardly walk over to grab the bullet that you put inside your ball. The brass slug. Because if you preload a brass cylinder against a spring in a 3D printed ball like this, and then take apart a $1 kitchen timer and harvest the geared mechanism, then when you wind up the whippable hemispheres, you get a one and a half second delay until this screw rotates and releases a spring loaded plug, just like an astronaut wrench. And that alters the trajectory in midair, making it impossible to predict where to swing. And as you can see, unpredictability is a pitcher's best friend. Unfortunately, after just two strikes, they found my Achilles heel and rendered the ball useless. Which is exactly why you always have a backup plan. Oh, just missed the strikeout. <laughs> this one used the same kitchen timer geared mechanism, only this time the two wiffle ball hemispheres were preloaded against each other with the spring. So after the one and a half second delay, <laughs> your hitting options went from one good- What a silly video. <laughs> what a silly video. This ball is impossible to hit. Here's what I did. I burned the ball and I made it smoke, and then I threw that smoke that I trapped into a container at the player. It was still technically the ball, but he couldn't hit it because you can't hit smoke. <laughs> Good one to two bad ones, which was just enough to secure my very first strikeout. <laughs> Unfortunately, the crafty Norpedo deduced correctly that by simply stepping forward, they could make contact before the ball had time to split. <laughs> Which meant it was time for the backup backup plan. The Wiffle Copter. And you might think, now I'm just being a bit cheeky. That's what I do think. I do think you're being a bit cheeky. But I did a thorough reading of the rules, and it's a strike if it hits anywhere on the pipe or metal plate above the two legs. But it makes no mention of front or back. Let's go. Let's go. Exploiting loop. <laughs> Being the other guy on the team being like, let's go, fuck yeah, baby. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, my smugness was short-lived because you don't become a professional wiffle ball player without a tremendous amount of hand-eye coordination. So with two runners on, it was time to level things up with this 3D printed, triple 10,000 RPM flywheeled monstrosity of a personal pitching machine, AKA the Demogorgon. Now the Demogorgon is calibrated to launch his cruise missiles at just under the 74 mile per hour speed limit on pitches in the league. The only problem is that kind of speed requires a lot of flowing electrons, and battery power soon became a concern. And that's just not a position you want to find yourself in with Captain Clutch at the plate, sadly giving them the first lead of the game. And I was concerned things would start to get away from me, but thankfully, <laughs> Jimmy can't take every at bat. And after a pop-up and a routine catch by the Red Baron, I'd Good survived job, Red the Baron. first inning with only one allowed run to show for. Did he say there's a max speed the balls can be? Like they can't be more than 74 miles an hour? How would they know? How would, how would you limit? That's funny. I wonder why that's the case. What an interesting rule. For the first time, I was feeling good about our chances, which meant it was time to show the world I was more than just a pitcher. Oh. You swing at that? Oh. How is that possible? You didn't come up with any gizmos for batting? There was another strikeout, but then Baron got on base, followed by Kyle with an absolute bomb to center field. Yeah! straight over the green monster, which meant suddenly we were up one to two. For the first time ever, we were in the lead, and at this rate, uh, 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 
Yeah, I struck out again. But we were still winning. And with the final play of the inning, Barron capitalized on a bad throw to second for a potential inside the park home run. But there's a major league wiffle ball rule where the strike zone doubles as the catcher. So if you don't beat the throw home, then you're out. And heading into the second inning, I was fresh out of batteries, so we Bummer. had Kyle take them out. And after two strikes, they got on base. Or at least they would have if first base didn't go rogue. And now the first base had a taste for freedom going free. Oh, it's not the title chat. Oh, the it's all about the ball. He has the fucking base working like a Roomba. Nobody bats an eye. I'm crazy because I didn't think he had a bat gizmo. Yet the fucking base gets to swivel around. Free range with a top speed of 50 miles per hour. I decided to bring him back after seeing the Norpedo was up next. Because there was plenty more where that came from. But my dreams were crushed when he just norped it out of the park. Oh, come on! Come on! Boo! And now the game was tied, and Jimmy had clearly demonstrated he's a sore winner. On the next play, they hit one deep and were threatening to score again, but I had a short-circuited first base that needed some avenge. <laughs> and with them ahead three to two headed into the bottom of the second this was the perfect time for my lucky bat oh there it is i was thinking why not just get a fucking tennis racket and just as i'd hoped the increased surface area put me on first base and with a little teamwork I scored a run, and we would have kept it going if someone wouldn't have struck out. Baron. Oh my gosh. Yeah, okay, fine, me too. So we were headed into the final inning, tied at three, and we kept Kyle on the mound, even though he said his arm wasn't at full strength. And of course, Captain Clutch took full advantage on the first pitch. Oh. So I volunteered to take over pitching duties. The problem was, I had run out of gimmick wiffle balls and gimmick personal pitching machines. But thanks to the power of pneumatics, I hadn't run out of gimmick strike zones. Which gave my floater a bit more room to work with. So after getting one out with the okay, that's kind of funny. generous strike zone, some good old fashioned hustle got us the second. But with Jimmy at bat and knowing what was at stake, one of their players disconnected the airline, which honestly felt a little like cheating, but I took the high road and let it slide. This time I was really out of tricks. It was just me versus Captain Clutch Norp himself, Mono Imano. And on my first pitch, I got him on the delayed riser. My second pitch, got him with my modified slider. If I was really gonna do this, I would need to rely on everything I had learned on this journey of discovery. He really did just make like a, like a shonen sports anime about himself and wiffle ball. Norpedo struck out? And that was strike three. Yes! I had struck out the world's greatest wiffle ball player. And earning that subtle nod of mutual respect from the Norpedo sort of felt like a Michael passing the torch to Kobe type of moment. <laughs> and down by one headed into our final at bat, it lasted about as long as it took to immediately strike me out again. That wasn't cool. Now the game wasn't over yet, but instead of the two runs we needed to win, we quickly got two outs. But Baron kept our hopes alive with the base hit. And by some absolute miracle, I finally got a real hit, fair and square. Oh yeah, go oh, Mark! Oh. Which put me and Baron on second and third. <laughs> Let's go! Oh wow. So it all came down to Kyle. No way, Kyle. And as soon as I saw contact, I knew it wasn't enough to clear the wall. So I started my mad dash with my sights set on home plate. It was a risky move, but I knew it would mean victory for our team. With Jimmy taking the cutoff at second, the gauntlet was thrown. His arm versus my legs. No more tricks. Okay, well maybe just one more trick. 
With a blast of air at 100 PSI, their catcher was nowhere to be found, clearing my triumphant <laughs> return to that most beautiful of white rubber pentagons. The, the, the darker version of this is just like, because this is like, this is no different than when Greedo in Star Wars, uh, or Zabulba in Star Wars fucked up Anakin's ship. It's like, just take out a gun and shoot the Norpedo at that point. Just, you know, fucking go out back, cap his legs. Who's that one ice skater, figure skater? Harding. Break the guy's kneecap. As we celebrated the game, it almost felt like at any moment the streetlights would come on, signaling it would be time to head home for dinner. And I was reminded of a truth it feels like Jimmy and Kyle and all of their buddies have never lost sight of. Finding something you're truly passionate about that brings you joy is one of life's most lovely gifts. Mark, what did you learn today? And if you're lucky enough to have found it, you should protect and cherish it like your most prized possession.